If you've ever been down on your luck, I have got an awesome interview for you today. As a matter of fact, this is the roofer He's an eight figure roofing contractor now, but he has been addicted to drugs on the streets. He's been fake facing Rico indictments. You know, you're going to learn here in this YouTube, the real story of a guy who actually was you know, behind bars, had to reform and change his life and went from zero to hero as a blue collar millionaire. And the reality is guys, it's hard when you have to go out there and work with your hands. America looks down at people that work with their hands. And this man built a literal empire starting one nail at a time. So today we've got the roofer Anthony Langdon. Did I get that right? Yep. All right, dude. You got it right. All right, man. I'm, I'm, crazy excited to unpack this this story you know yeah um i'm super grateful and honorable just to be we here. just went to ufc yeah. 299 yeah. we had an awesome weekend dude it was really crazy um, on, a, on a whim on a whim dude how did, how did that happen on, you know you just reached out on on insta and said hey see what you're made of you willing to fly down from to see ufc and here we are dude i saw this guy's content on the internet i knew he was my brother from another mother and I said, hey, just get in an airplane, get down here, let's go to the fights. Yeah. And we spent time you know, yesterday at the pool talking about your journey yeah. and your life. And I got so many stories because you were a Marine, you've been to jail and you started on the roof. Yeah. And now you're an eight figure guy. Absolutely, yep. Um, so walk me to the very beginning. You, know, you told me some stories that you kind of always were sort of an entrepreneur yeah, I mean, I can start my first uh, business venture when I was 12 was <clears throat> started when my school had a little jogathon. We would go door knocking for selling laps around the track. So I was going to jog for money. Oh, nice. Yeah. And so we would. But what I did was I created that when there was no jogathon after the fact. And me and my buddies were door knocking and had a sales pitch like on. a jogathon for profit. Yeah. Oh, that's sick. And so we were, <clears throat> we had a sales pitch how to get, you know, donations per lap. But we would always say, hey, for a one time donation for $5 cash, we won't have to come back and collect so we could get money now. And so we started this little plan. And of course, this jogathon was in the uh, fall, but this was in the spring. And so we'd walk the neighborhoods, uh, knocking doors, seeing if we could get cash posing as a jogathon donations for the school. So since day one, fitness has been a part of your journey in yeah. entrepreneurship. <laughs> yeah. And get, getting my buddies, you know, the, the, the plan to knock on the door, what to say, overcome, you know, the, the per lap or the one-time donation to get them no checks, cash only. Plan. So you've been building door-to-door -door sales teams since you were 12. It's my, yes. That's crazy. So um, your roofing business, where yeah. is it located? What kind of business is it? Uh, my business is located in North Seattle area, the greater Pacific Northwest. It's a retail market. Um, there's a lot of rain, a lot of moss, a lot of mold. Got to have a new roof. Got to have a new roof every 20 years. No, no ifs, ands, or buts about it. It's just part of life. Are people broke up there? No, there's a lot. There's a lot of resource. Uh, it's a good ecosystem of tech. It's kind of its own. Um, Economy and its own tech self. people like to do their roofs themselves or do their handyman no, work themselves. The beauty themselves. thing is that the tech people need guys that can work with their hands. The service based businesses thrive there because the tech people um, really need our help because they're not getting on the roof anytime soon. So, so um, I really want to get into like the nitty gritty part because, you know, when you say that you've been a roofer for a long time, I mean, yeah. when did you first get in the roofing business? 2003. 2003. Let's yeah. let's let's talk about who you were back in 2003. What did, what was Anthony? Uh, 2003, I had I got out of the Marine Corps in 2000. In 2000, um, I spent two years in there, broke my leg twice, went through boot camp for nine months um, in Marine Corps boot camp, and it was such a dramatic shift in my mindset as a person. It was intense. Um, hurt or not they kept me there uh and it went from 13 weeks to nine months got out of that healed up broke my leg again they gave me an honorable discharge um which was kind of devastating but it also uh set me on this path of like mental endurance adapt and overcome just deep grit got into got came home got into bodybuilding 
Um, very competitive in that, that realm. Spent a couple years there. In that world, ended up having a son. Uh, became a single father who um, that, that situation really dramatically shifted my perspective in caring for another human, getting down, getting to work. What am I going to do? Um, bodybuilding wasn't quite panning out. Life was getting pretty fucking hard. Um, no, no real, real aim. And so <clears throat> as I was kind of like spiraling out as a 20-year-old with a son, uh, I had some family in Florida, flew to Florida, tried to see what I could do, worked for $10 an hour for my uh, cousin's roofing company, Guys Roofing in Fort Walton Beach. Um, I was 265, power lifting, squatting, trying to roof. And it was ridiculous. It was hot. I, when I came to Florida, I realized hell existed on earth. It's on the roof in Florida. Right. It's like 180 coming at you and like 120 on your back. Yeah. And um, it took about two weeks to realize, I think I could fucking do this by myself. Kind of got into it with my cousin. He, he was like, you're... The story of all roofing companies. Yes. It's, <laughs> it's like two weeks in, I'm fully qualified to start my own business. And so <clears throat> ventured off kind of seeing if I can get some roofs and then a hurricane hit my first experience of what that looked like. And so I had this false sense that roofing business is easy. Roofs are everywhere. This is fucking great. Made a bunch of money. Me and my son were living down there. Hurricane Katrina came, Hurricane Ike came. Uh, life was good in the roofing space. Um, I learned a ton about myself, roofing, uh, acquired a new trade, Door this knocking. time you're doing insurance restoration, right? Yeah, I was actually just kind of subbing underneath a bunch of roofing companies. I had my own license, which was hard to get, but I didn't understand a lot about business. Mm -hmm. I knew money. But you were I, still building a network. Yep. And long and short in that whole time span, um, drugs became a problem. Mm. Uh, just you, because success and partying, it just fell down um, the wrong I think path. a lot of wrong crowd. A lot of guys I was working with, there was a lot of drugs on the roof. Kind of like roofing, man. It's sort of how it is. You know, the best damn roofer, he's out here sort of making fun of it, but yep. telling him about cocaine and drinking and yep. smoking and yep. alcoholism is yep. a big problem. Big problem in, in, in the roofing space. And I, was, I got caught in that. Um, and that led to just total destruction, 2000. Mm -hmm nine me and now two kids basically lost trucks dumpsters every penny i had invested into it and i was on a greyhound back to washington and that was a rock bottom told, I, you would think it was you would think it was yeah <laughs> all right but uh, it but this is not this is not criminal enterprise Anthony. no this, this is this is in that process there was this uh frustration building oh you a monster was in, in, was, in, was being created i think so mm -hmm. and um there's a lot of resentment anger at the world all the time mm -hmm. two kids no help woe is me victim mindset Vic, victim mindset but very competitive uh failure after failure after failure but yet super you know just intense wanting to win mm -hmm. you know um bodybuilding was in my blood Marine Corps in my blood, just always wanting to Did win. Did you have mentors to teach you about business and money? You know, the only person that was consistent in my life with that was my father. Mm -hmm. He was always a phone call away through the whole thing. He didn't really let me at his house, but. He, was, <laughs> he at least was there for you to answer the phone. <laughs> yeah. So walk me back to Washington. You, you know, in the future have got, you know, a RICO case. You got an operation. Yep. You literally got all kinds of, you know, all kinds of things going on. Um, yep. How do you go from rock bottom to that? Because it seems like you gotta you gotta have a business mind for sure to be the COO of a so <laughs> enterprise. Yeah. So I when I came back to Washington, I tried to get into the roofing space up there, um, and I also brought a lot of bad habits with me: drug business, um, theft business from Texas, Te the Texas Florida connection connections. <laughs> yes, brought it back into Washington where I was from, and. Um, started forming a team of people where we were distributing drugs, uh, theft, pretty good ring size. Like a motorcycle gang? Sure. <laughs> yeah. You know, and it was, but there was a lot of, there was a lot of guy, guys and girls struggling. Uh, and, you know, as a business 
minded. I knew that. Now, even in that, was there like a brotherhood, or did you like? Did you like the camaraderie and involved in it? There, there, there was. There, these people were hurting. We were all hurting. We were all trying to survive, and we we're all trying to create income. And so I created a way for us to have income, you know, and do things and sell things. And um, even then, you're selling your vision to your to your team every day. What? Well, when? When did that start? What was your vision? How did you? Well, I'm gonna become a big operations guy here and distribute and well it, it all started it, you know it, it you, whenever i see a need uh, or a problem mm -hmm. my mind goes into how can i turn it into a profitable solution mm -hmm. and um there's no income on the street but these guys have a high energy mm -hmm. and, and ready to do whatever it takes mm -hmm. you know it's amazing how much uh, a drug addict can make in a day without a job mm -hmm. and so you you give them things to do and how to make money and you start I started orchestrating um, theft rings and drugs and um, you know my mind started getting really into this and it started to it started to really grow all up and down the I-5 corridor which is Interstate 5 running north and south through Washington. So how many people were involved in this? 30. 30? 30, 30, 40 people. That's a corporation. Yeah. And so how many years was this going on? Um, we were going pretty hard for about three years. And when did the pressure from the, from the feds? Well, it start, what, what, what started happening was, you know, people were getting in trouble, talking, Ratting. telling, um, which hindsight was the greatest thing that happened to me. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it brought me to a place where now, were you still heavily using drugs and drink, drinking and stuff at this point? I was definitely heavily using drugs. Mm -hmm. Never really drank, but it was, the drugs were starting to un, just unravel me mm -hmm. at a high level. Um, like speed, crack? Oh, it was heroin. Oh, meth. heroin, meth. Yeah. The worst. The worst. And, and it's, hard, it's hard to imagine now that I was in a place where I thought it was acceptable to use heroin mm -hmm. in that you know, life can bring you to a place where you would do things and think ways to get that drug and try to survive. Now you're in Washington yeah, and you've got this line of people that think, you know, legalize everything, give them a place. Mm -hmm. You got a homeless problem. You got a drug epidemic. We're talking, yeah. you're talking about there's needles everywhere. Yeah. I mean, I was like, that's not normal. No. You know, no, um, it's why it's, do you think that's going on in like Seattle? <laughs> Well, I, I think it's going on there because it's um, it's a it's a victimized state where they I think they 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 I don't want to say they want us to be that way, but it's I believe that it's they're wreaking havoc on our minds to normalize this victim mentality there, and it's holding the people down. And so you're trapped in uh, drug addiction, distribution, yeah. Yeah. feds are coming after you. It, there's got to be the second rock bottom. How did this come? Well, it came from a series of cases getting built, getting arrested, bailed out, arrested, bailed out, and they were stacking. All these problems were starting to come my way. And there was a moment when they finally pinned me in the corner and arrested me, and, and it was one of the greatest days of my life. I was tired. Did you just feel like a burden was lifted off? I was just off ready of to go. And as we were kind of in court and be trying to defend my case, because in my mind I was saying, well, I wasn't actually doing anything. It wasn't me that did any of these things, but it was me who was orchestrating these things. And I remember the day when I was um, talking to my attorney and the DOC. So this is what RICO means. And a lot of people don't understand this. My wife was like, what do you mean RICO? Yeah. So what, what, explain to like uh, I people think exactly. essentially where the, the reasons why everything was happening was because of my influence or my plan or my mastermind. Um, and people, I think it, when people feel like there's going to be a consequence to not doing what's, what you're, what they're told, I think that's where RICO comes in, where they're, they try to get the guy that's masterminding it and they use everyone else that's doing the work to form a case against that guy. So now you're facing federal pressure, federal time, and how many how many years was it? Well, when we first started talking, they were throwing 18 at me. Mm. And um, you'd miss. How old would your kids be? Well, I would be getting out right about now, so I'd have uh, 20, yeah, 22 year old and an 18 year old son. 
that I would miss the whole, mm -hmm. I'd miss the whole deal. And I think in the moment, what I <clears throat> realized with all of these, these moments in my, my life came down to, I was sitting in the cell in the moment of like honesty, tell the truth, lay it out there, take whatever comes at you. It's time to quit acting like a child and quit running from whatever it is you're running from, which was myself. And, and, and let's get this on. What is it? And I remember I have this, always this desire that I can talk my way into everything. I can talk you into buying from me. I can talk you into doing this. I can, you know, this skill set, if you will, of, I wouldn't call manipulation, but just sales, sales, the ability to influence. Yes. Sales. And I've been doing it my whole life so much. So I wasn't even sure of exactly who I was. I was selling my own self into something that wasn't real. And I remember saying, you know, what we're going to do, we're going to just tell the truth. We're going to lay it off because I felt like I could talk myself into a lesser than sentence or manipulate the situation. Uh, it, but the risk was starting to get too high. And for me, this was probably the true rock bottom. But it was it was also a great day because I was ready to just embrace and pay the price for my decisions. Now, at this time, everyone goes to jail. At what point do you like start to have a conversation with God or start to, you know, have some sort of or is this a part of your decision? I, I always had a relationship with with God. I was raised in it. My mom mm -hmm. and dad are devout Catholic and I, I you know, I believe in Jesus. It's mm -hmm. it's always been there. But and I hate to say the, you know, the jailhouse Christian or whatnot. Right. I can't say that's my part of the story either. That came in at this moment. It was just me. Um, getting right with myself and embracing it. When mm -hmm. I got my relationship with, with Jesus at the time was a year into my sentence. Okay. That's a whole nother story. But it, in this moment when I was of clarity, I was able to be honest with myself and with the, my lawyer and with the state. And it took the 18 and turned into five. Okay. And um, went on to prison and in prison, I started having this revelation of my own behavior, um, being a liability to the community, um, my cellmate who was doing life without, um, really had an impact on my life. And I watched him be happy, joyous and free. He's never getting out. And I thought, what the fuck is my problem? And what is it about him? What do you have that I don't understand? What did he have? He had a relationship with Jesus. Mm. He used to walk around the yard talking to himself. People made fun of him. I remember one day asking him, like, who are you talking to? He's like, God. He's like, maybe you should talk maybe to him. Maybe you should him. try. Maybe you should try it. And, you know, we, I can't say me and him were best friends, so I thought he was kind of weird. But he had a point. And it, it brought me to this place of uh, relationship with, with, with God and, uh, and with myself and able to really look at my own liabilities and how do I flip every one of those behaviors into an asset-minded way of thinking. Yeah, I asked you yesterday, what's the best way for someone to make a comeback? What's the most important thing? You gave me a really good answer. Humility, knowing that you don't know and that your best thinking is why you're where you're at and that maybe you don't know. And I was sitting there in a cell realizing that my best hustle has got me right here. So maybe I don't know what I'm doing and I need something greater than myself and to get outside of myself to evolve myself and change the way I think. Wow. So does personal development start inside jail? From that point, you're reading the Bible, you're doing things, but are you doing business personal development? Um, well, I, I wasn't really focusing on business. I was focusing on yourself, on myself and getting my mind shifting back into, or even maybe for the first time, trying to have, um, uh, how am I going to run business, but with the right ethics, but you with, knew you were going to go into roofing again. Um, I, I tried, I tried to not, I always was like, no, I'm not going back into roofing. Oh, cause you thought not, there would be a bunch of drug addicts sure. and pull you back. Into roofing the is world. like the, the mob. Once you're in, you know, too much, you can't get out. <laughs> <laughs> roofing is like the mob. <laughs> Once you know how to do it, it's hard to, hard to get out. But I, I, um, I started getting really competitive with myself. I started a morning routine. I started making sure I was up before the guard when they did the count. 
I started making sure I cleaned myself first, first to chow, first on the, on, on, um, at the weight pile, first in everything, getting myself in shape, um, bringing guys with me, and having a strict protocol of the way I lived in there. And I thought, well, I'm gonna start right now and I'm gonna master my own self and my own routine and my own life and put it to work. Uh, and I started gaining, well, one, my, my physique back, my confidence back. Um, it took, took me a little while to, before I started reading again. Then I started reading books. I studied John Wooden, studied like Mother Teresa, studied uh, Abraham Lincoln, and really just kind of got my mind changed into a different direction, listening um, to Coach Wooden, reading his books, realizing that the fundamentals, the details, all the little things is what makes the big things come. And I just started really focusing on, it is, it is impo- life or death to be first up. It's life or death to do the same thing every day. It's life mm-hmm. or death the way you talk to people. Uh, and so the whole thing became, this is life or death. It's not a game anymore. It's serious. Life is serious. Business is serious. Having kids is serious. This whole thing is serious. And um, I started getting a lot of confidence and I started changing and I started realizing I think a lot of people need help and they don't take it that serious. They don't take life that serious. And so the journey kind of began. Oh, dude, I love this part of the story because the door opens up. You walk out of jail. What's that feel like? What do you do? <laughs> you know, the, when the release from prison in 2014 was a culture shock for me. My dad picked me up. Of course, I get a $200 bus ticket, and they take taxes and fees anyway off of that. So I got 168 bucks. My dad comes down and picks me up. Um, I got nowhere to live. I ain't got shit on, to my name. And he's gonna allow me to sleep on a cot in his basement because I am on parole and I have to have an address or I can't get out. This, you know, my parents were, and everybody rightfully so, were just kind of like, well, we'll see what happens with this fucking guy. And we don't know where he's gonna go with it. And I just remember um, I wanted to keep the same routine. I had a little cot, I slept on it, I got up in the morning, did the exact same thing and I uh, didn't have a driver's license, so I walked to the gym. Um, I got a job. Um, Well, let's back up to the trip home. So going home, I went to eat, and I'm in a restaurant, and I realized there was a cell phone pandemic that I saw, because when I went in, there wasn't the smartphone situation was flip phones it was like the razor and i think the sidekick the blackberry like there was some tech the next we're starting to get halfway smart yeah the bleep bleep you know there was some there was some cool stuff but the walkie talkie yeah the the (laughs) next tail the yeah and um i noticed that everybody looked gray fat and staring at their phone i was at a restaurant and i'm looking around and i was i couldn't believe what what had changed because i'd never seen that before and then Facebook, I was like, Facebook was mind blowing. The connection that, that people had with each other. Facebook was there when I went, went in, but I was so busy. I never, I had never been on Facebook. And so honestly, to this day, I still don't have Facebook. So it's so, so foreign to me. It's all foreign to you. Well, you need a Facebook. I'm your social media coach. You're good at social media. Instagram's connected to Facebook. The reels, you just click. Go to both places right. you get. Twice as many views. Yeah. You're sleeping on the most important platform. I know. And I, and I, I learned that people are um, really falling behind, man, and that I had a gift of being incarcerated for a really good time where now I was ahead. It, it did not put me behind. It put me ahead. I had an opportunity to not be distracted and think and read and write the ideas and the plans and what I was reading, I would write and how I would interpret it. And I was legitimately changing the way I thought every single day. And so when I got out, I could clearly see that the competition was on the floor. And that basically you were gonna eat their lunch. I felt like it was no problem. Okay, so I love where you were talked about um, that you were willing to go out there with your hands and you I don't know where in the story you started to well, change to change when, when it, I when, yeah so when I first started out I was cleaning houses mm-hmm. cleaning toilets mm-hmm. did that for four to six months something like that 
Um, and then I started working with my hands. I got a, a job with eight dollars an hour doing some sheetrock work, and then finally got back in the roofing space when I felt that I could. I bought some tools and I got a job installing for twenty dollars an hour, and I was so humbled by just the opportunity to be able to work and work for a good wage and earn every bit of it. And I had this thing that I wanted to it, not inflict pain on myself, but I wanted to feel every inch of what it takes to go all the way to the top. From the bottom. From the bottom. Even though you ran a criminal enterprise or ran a roofing company or new sales or been an entrepreneur since 12, this is like when you have trauma sometimes, like some of the best therapy is the work. Getting into the work. And I felt the fact that I was um, out and free with my two children back in my life at the time that, that I didn't deserve anything more than that. I was blessed to even just have that. So uh, allowing somebody, uh, allowing me to work for them again and trusting me was huge for me. And I wanted to be a really good employee for people. I wanted to be honorable to whoever uh, was gonna pour into me. And I became just a really good installer for somebody that uh, took a chance on me, even with an ankle monitor on and all the other stuff he, he allowed me to work for him. And I began the journey of um, getting myself back into society, back into the roofing space. This is 2015 now. And <clears throat> all I did was put my head down and roof. And I started gaining confidence. I started um, attracting a reputation as a hard worker. I started getting the nickname, he's an asset which is obviously now the name of my company, Asset Roofing, um, was I was adding value to people. So it was a service-minded mindset. How do you go from on the crew, where are the next graduated steps? So when I'm, I'm working with him, I, he was a cash roofer, so everything was cash. He didn't even have a legitimate business. Mm -hmm. uh, I proposed to him one day, I said, I think we need to file a business and let's, let's take it to the next thing. And he, let's get an LLC and, and accept yeah, checks. Yeah. And I said, I want to, um, I think it's time for me to start scaling. And we didn't see eye to eye on that. And we, we, I started getting roofs and splitting them with him. I started, um, evolving myself, but he wasn't coming with me. It was my first experience of, I was outgrowing somebody that was, that I came in underneath. It was a part of the family. Yeah. And, and it was, it was, uh, one, I'm really grateful for everything he gave me, mm -hmm. but at the same time I was like, it's time to go and I started if <clears throat> I filed my business and started door knocking for roofs let's go through that pitch baby what was that pitch well the pitch at the time was more or less like why pay all that money for the company that's advertising and got all the oh come on give me the pitch <laughs> knock 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 hello well one I just would I would not no, say you, hey. I'm the homeowner just sell me <laughs> they love this shit. You don't yeah. understand. It's, how are Just, you doing today? I'm doing great. Great. Did you, I, I was walking by, did you know that your roof has got a lot of moss on it? Do you have a moment today just to talk about what that could do? Yeah. Um, I only got a minute, got to run out to uh, an appointment, but uh, sure, I'm not really in the market for a roof right now. But then I would kind of say, hey, I just did Kelly's roof down the street mm -hmm. and she wasn't in the market for a roof either. Mm -hmm. Um, I was roof cleaning, just an annual maintenance, and discovered there was granule loss, and granule loss can mean massive damage. There's an unforeseen enemy in there that you can't see, yeah. and that's my experience. I can see that with this much moss on your roof, you might have mold infection in there, and mold mm. can really wreak havoc on the way you, you process information. It can make your kids sick. You might have- All right, go ahead, go ahead. Check me out. Yeah, it's really good for both of us if we do. If worst case, in, I mean, best case, I can clean this thing. You know, let me just figure out what it is and get up on the roof in, in Washington, granule loss anywhere is, is the enemy mm -hmm. and mold just, and so eats I eats up the roof. Yeah. And so now you're coming down and you're saying, let's do it now. Well, my, my, my plan there was the photos to show, I love that to show them, um, not to put fear in them, but you know, let hey, the roof speak for itself. Let the roof speak for itself. And I was trying to articulate through visual aid on my phone. Mm -hmm. I saw this, I'd pull some moss up in the granule loss and then I'd show them a picture of what it looks like on other roofs I found when I found this, what it looked like underneath. And then I, if you show them, not tell them, they can't call you a liar. Correct. 
And it's, it's not that I'm trying to sell you a roof. I'm trying to add value to you and bring awareness to what's happening on your house. So I'm not here knocking and telling you something you don't need. I'm tell, I'm you helping. can't sell a roof to somebody who don't need it. Right. And people said no soliciting. And I said, this isn't soliciting. This is me bringing awareness to something that you have because this is what I do for a living. And mold can wreak havoc on your mind and your mental health. And in Washington, this could is poison your kids. Yes. What are we doing here? What are we doing here? I <laughs> want so, in that Washington market, dude. That sounds like a fun pitch. It, 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 but it's true. And most people in Washington aren't from Washington. And so I want to educate you on what life's like here. Mm -hmm. Just like if I moved to Texas, yeah. I hope that people would tell me what. About hail. If you move to Florida, we'll tell you about hurricanes and yeah. crooked insurance companies and huge yeah. deductibles. Yeah. And so it, you know, door not, I remember, I think it was a 60 house area I knocked 60 doors got about five roofs mm. and was able to perform good work and it that's kinda... that's beautiful Hold on, let's do the math on this because I yeah. say if you knock 50 doors that there's almost no way you won't get to at least two kitchen tables at least, but you yeah. had without insurance 50, 60 doors 60 doors five roofs and so you know these started off with repairs some of them or they were five re-roofs oh really and then some in roofs cleaning all in one big neighborhood and the neighborhood was so even retail it's the law of the six-pack when they see you doing the job yep there's a lot of guys that don't knock on the door that don't go and sell around their jobs well there's a couple of things i believe in door knocking is that i think the universe responds to the behavior mm -hmm. of the persistent person mm -hmm that can think it, speak it, and make it happen. And so when you believe in your product and you're knocking on the door, it's criminal not to knock on the door yep. and not bring them aware that your roof needs to be redone. In Washington, you know, storm, it's the same thing. Hey, there is, there's a way that you could get this roof and not pay for it because you pay into insurance. You see wind damage all over. So when, and now going back to my jogathon days or knocking on the door, when you believe what you're selling, mm -hmm people feel that. And so when, when, when I started my business, it, it wasn't about hustling for money. It was about adding value to the neighborhood because mm -hmm. they do need a new roof. And why, why not me? So after you sold these jobs, mm -hmm. you go up there with the shingles on your shoulder, these first jobs, these first jobs, I, I loaded all the material in my truck, brought it to the roof, dumpster, tore it all off, labor or two, and paid them their $20 an hour and put these roofs on Damn. All, all of them. And, and you told me like when you're nailing that thing, after you sold your own job, when you've nailed for $20 an hour, what's the difference when you're nailing like this time? You're nailing for 500 an hour. Woo! And what's get, that feel like? You get energy for days, 12 hours, four, it doesn't matter. It's a high. And, and, and before that, you're just recapping back when you're making 13 cents in the dish pit in prison. This is easy money. In fact, that's what I say to people all the time, easy money. And they say, no, my roofer says, this is easy money. I'm like, no, I work hard. And I'm like, no, trust me, this is easy money. We're, the, roofing is uh, a gateway into uh, freedom, financial freedom. Okay, so yeah. I always say that the first step to scaling to 10 million is selling a million yourself. We yep. have got to the point where you've got your first few jobs. How do you sell your first million? So those first five jobs actually catapulted me into uh, the, one of the most pivotal years of the whole business. Um, I got some yard signs with that money um, and that those re referrals led to this roof, to this roof, to this roof. And I was able to build out uh, leads and referrals where in one year, I think I knocked uh, maybe 120 estimates sold about 70 roofs and roofed every single one of them myself. Ooh. And how much did you make off of 70 roofs you do yourself? About 400K. Damn, but a 400K laborer. And I took that money and I was stacking it and stuffing it and I learned how to make a website, mm -hmm. wrote the content, mm -hmm. um, got the first website so going. So you make your first million, now you're like, okay, how do I go to the next step? Well, I, I you said you, you found I, Facebook, but now you must have found YouTube. Well, I was what happened in that first million was I, I still was stuck on the roof and that mm -hmm. was a roofer mentality. Yeah. And so what I was doing was training my body to survive another year. Mm -hmm. I went into the next year roofing my ass off again. And of course, the, at this point, I'm like 37 mm -hmm. and it's not looking 
too cute to be this old on the roof and all these guys are younger than me. And I remember standing there one day, like I can't shingle enough and roof enough to pull this off. I'm gonna have to think. And I remember roofing in this neighborhood and I'm like, ping, ping, ping. And I could hear the roof going off and my mind go, wait a minute. What if I could figure out how to be here and there at the same time? And, and then all of a sudden I was going back to, okay, here we go. So I'm now gonna, you're going to build the crew out. You're going to build the teams. I'm going to build the teams. And we're going to like start to scale. We're going to scale. And we're, I'm and, going all in. And so what did that look like, your first steps? Um, the first steps was the crew that I was with, really getting them underneath my, the way I wanted them to do the, to do the job, setting them up for success, how to behave, the first kind of SOP, if you will, on how we're going to perform the roof. Uh, and then me getting off the roof. And it was really weird to get off the roof and run leads all day. Cause like, I thought the money was made on the roof by mm -hmm. going fast mm -hmm. and that, um, but then I, once I kind of got two or three roofs sold and realized I can keep them busy, mm -hmm. I started to realize I'd make more money selling and keeping them busy. So this transformation says, oh wow. Selling's the most prioritized task. I'm yes. gonna just sell my ass off. Sell, sell as much as possible. And then simultaneously figuring out how can I have more leads? Mm, beautiful. So you're trying to get yourself teaching SEO, yourself teaching yep. Google, you're doing all these things. And yep. I think people forget that even a guy that, you know, where there's a will, there's a way they don't take the time to do it. When, when, when you, when you have an aim and you have a mission, and you know why you're doing it, mm -hmm. nothing will stand in your way. And we talked about this being an age of people being distracted, even roofers. Yeah. And they, most of these guys would never self-taught SEO. As a matter of fact, you know, even myself, I have, I have, didn't find it all that interesting. Well, I, I, so I haven't, I don't, I don't know as much as I should about well, how to do it, I, what to do. I, uh, one, I didn't, I would talk to a few guys and I did not trust anything they were fucking saying. I started realizing my thought that marketers are full of shit. Full of shit. They, they call whatever they call a lead. Do you know how to know where a marketer's lying? What's that? Just guess. Yeah. When? When a marketer's lying? When they talk. <laughs> that's right. That's, that's right. Everyone's a fucking marketer. Well, listen, I'm a marketer and here's what I say. I believe that you're better off with my services within without it. And so I will get your attention. Yeah. So I believe all's fair and love and war and getting my foot in the door. Yeah. And then delivering over the top. Yep. And so if I believe in that, some people might say that's an exaggerant way to get someone's attention borderline pushing what's true, but it's not, it's not an untruth. And it basically you got your attention to the truth. So that's a marketer's justification. <laughs> <laughs> it, but when I, when I really started learning marketing, I realized that the power of perception, I was always obsessed with when somebody sees the brand and the logo, what is it making them feel? And is, is what I'm articulating driving them to me? And when they do drive them to me, what do they think of me? And I could tell when I came to their house, whether they saw me as high value or low value by the way they talked to me. And I would tweak my marketing and I would tweak my logo and I would tweak the wording until they started talking to me differently. I love the Rooferpreneur logo. Uh, what does that mean to you? What is that about? Because you have this awesome explanation yesterday in the pool. It's a transformation. It's, a, it's, a mind, it's an evolution of thinking. There's a way to think as a roofer, and then there's a way to think as an entrepreneur, and it's a, it's a complete journey that I went on um, to evolve myself from a, a guy stuck as a technician in his job, working with his hands, which is a skill set, to a guy leveraging his mind and his personal development and creating a system and a business for other people to be employed in. This is beautiful. And it's, it's becoming this obsession of mine because the last 10 years, um, just trying to survive and win and my kids and evolve as a person, I, fig I was realizing I was going through all these different phases in life to change. And here I am thinking in this entrepreneur mindset space um, and it freed me from some heavy demons in my life and I want to now help other guys open up those doors to leverage their skill sets that they have on the roof, put the hammer down and pick up the phone, leverage technology, leverage your mind and not your back. And let me show you how. See, I love this part of the story because this is where your brother, my brother from another mother, and I just want to keep going through the growth cycle because you've gotten probably close to 
by yourself at this point, you're probably selling multiple millions. Yes. Multiple millions. Yes. All retail. Yes. You've got like this, this, and I'm, I'm soon, I'm sure you encountered sort of a similar problem with, with sales that you could only sell a certain amount of jobs, just yes. like you could only install a certain amount of jobs. And, and you're, you're, it's right where that $10 million mark hit where personal development, leadership, management, sales team, uh, strategy was, is now starting to come into play. And what I'm learning now is that I need to learn. Mm -hmm. I need to surround myself with people that know. Mm -hmm. I need to uh, vet the people that I'm gonna be with and hire coaching and hire, uh, and, and the humility piece, because I wanna keep winning. Mm -hmm. I wanna keep Absolutely. growing. Um, I, where, where I've hit now, I don't even think I've gotten started. I just kind of had my head down for the last 10 years. I look up and I'm, here I am. So if I'm coming to work with you, I want to hear the story of your first best, most successful sales rep. How were you able to teach that guy? What did he do? Let's do a little case study on that guy in Washington. Yeah. And even if he's with you or not, just be like, this is an example. Of I, I have a, I have a, a sales rep now that was a roofer mm -hmm. and he is killing it oh, great. in the retail. So he's just like you. He roofed with me. Oh, great. He was a young, he was one of those laborers that I was talking about back in the day, which we had a massive falling out because uh, he thought I was an asshole. And now he's back. And he is, we're leveraging him as a, uh, in retail in Washington, he's a roofing technician, he's an expert. And so he understands the shingles installation, the um, customer journey, what it's like to install. And we, we, we sell that to the customer, the knowledge, the authority, um, the trust, uh, and it's, and you can physically see that we're roofers. Mm -hmm. And so like building his first million dollar, has he, where is his hiccups? What does he need to, like, honestly, is he able to go out there and sell as much as you were able to sell or close to it? 60, 70% as much. I would say right now he's knocking on the door of being better than me. Oh, wow. That's beautiful. I love it when you come across those. Yes. He's making me look real good. Like I know what I'm doing. But what, what I think is, what I think we leverage is technology. We leverage photos, we leverage quote presentation, we, we leverage um, knowledge. Um, we we kind of call it this Jeff Bezos experience where a lot of information, uh, a lot of communication, um, a lot of visual aids, and we have this idea we can control the narrative of what the customer is going to hear and what we want them to see. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we hone in on is when we come to your house is we try to find all the things that, and we help you see it from a visual perspective. See what I love about this is like my whole promise to my customers is like, it's hard to find a roofer you can trust. Yep. Transparency builds trust. Yes. So you give them all this information, yes. all the stuff up front, all this communication. Yes. Then you know what? They know that you're probably going to stand behind the job better. They're probably we're invested gonna, yeah and we're trying to we one of our core values is communicate through education mm -hmm. and so communication is not a text i'll be on my way it's teaching them what's going to happen empowering the customer with what's happening while we're on your roof who's coming what's the plywood what's this mean and teaching them along the way so in the end they actually feel now that they understand what they just got and how to how to take care of it yeah dude i love it and i love that um you know, whether it's scaling the leads, scaling the salespeople or knocking doors, retail is the same scaling in insurance. It's the same. More yeah. leads, more salespeople, more doors, more kitchen table presentations. Yes. Um, we talked a little bit about a sales process to get a higher margin. Mm -hmm. You know, um, walk me through a little bit of like the step by step way you get the maximum price per square. Well, we ho we hone in on a system that is um, bulletproof, where it's the top products, it's the top insulation practices, it's ice and water shields in every situation, it's the setup to protect your yard, it's the full communication, it's the, the staff that's employed, it's the safety programs, it's uh, up to codes and then some, and that this is the standard. Mm. And so we, we hone in on that to um, separate ourselves from 
the rest of the roofing companies. There's a ton of roofers, but there's only a few roofing contractors. How many of them give a written proposal after an estimate in a computerized format? Not much. How many of them give them an estimate with photos? Even less. How many of them can sit there, spend an hour, go through the whole thing and create an experience? It goes down to, and so when you start to really hone in that right there, your closing ratios and your higher value um, per square price can go up. And some guys would say, well, <clears throat> you know, you're not, it's not a fair price to the customer. And I used to kind of be that guy, mm -hmm. but I, I now believe and I know that the more you charge and the more that you can provide value and the, the, the longer you can stay in business, the better it is for the customer. The more you can pay the laborers, yep. the more that you can pay the people in your company, yep. the more the people like going to work, yep. like delivering smiles, even if something doesn't go right. Yes. And that stuff is really what we're judged on. Yes. And, and it costs money to facilitate that to scale that and have that promise to the customer. Mm. Okay, so walk me through like what you see in the next few years, what you wanna do as roofpreneur and what, what you're trying to do with your company. Well, in my company, in my market, we wanna become the most dominant force mm. in the community. We, my goal is to have the roofing space come through my business, that we set the standard, we set the narrative, we set set the price in the area and we had a ton of value to the community give back and um, also open up a pathway for roofers to join my team and actually become a better roofer a better person and get paid more love that so we, we want to hold everyone to a higher standard mainly because i was that roofer with low standards and that i believe that uh, a roofer should stand tall be proud of what he does work his ass off and um evolve dude i love it my mission is to make roofing cool so that the next generation yep. of kids want to yep. get in here and yep. they want to like become a blue collar millionaire like me i'm 38 years That's old i'm trying to get a hundred million dollar check you know so we joke about making making roofing great again exactly and not giving it up and and what people inspire to want to work hard again and work with their hands learn the skills and scale a business. We talked, you're a single dad, you got two kids, you know, one of them 18, another one 23? 22, yeah. 22. Yeah. You wanna get them, What? How, what's your vision for them at moving forward, like your mentorship and yeah. how they fit into this? I'm, I'm trying to teach them that anything's possible. Um, think for yourself, um, serve people, or you're gonna serve those that do and give back and you said there was like sometimes at school maybe the influence from whether it's teachers or other people or other kids and they're like maybe i should just settle maybe i should get an hourly job maybe i should just go be a mechanic yeah and, and what do you have to say whenever you're well when, when i realized especially in washington that the school system was making my kids think mediocre mm -hmm. we pulled them out okay and we we i think um conversations around our table is freedom of thought uh, think grow grow yourself there's so much abundance in America don't let them set what a good living is what a good job is what a good income is mm -hmm. you set that you go make that you go create that and you can and so um, it's really really cool because I know like there's gonna be some crazy things out there but you told me you know in your market it's pretty often that you come across roofs with wind damage. Yep. Um, what do your typical roofers in your market do when there's just a missing shingle or two? Well, we, we don't even think about if the homeowner has insurance. Mm -hmm. And I'm coming to realize that, you know, they have homeowner's insurance. They might qualify for insurance claim. They might qualify to get help on the roof because that's what they pay for. And I think. But well, most of the time you just sell them a whole roof replacement. Whole, we just sell them a roof replacement. And, and I, I would tell you that most of the time that's the better way to go. Yeah. And if a guy's not going to do a loan or not going to afford it, but he has a little damage, yeah. maybe that's an easier way to get the deal in the pipeline yeah. on one you wouldn't get. When you wouldn't but get. I wouldn't say that selling retail first is bad. No, I, I think that I think a repair is is never an option. Mm -hmm. Not when not when it's your number one line of defense for mm -hmm. your house. Right. It's not the best option. No. And either. so um, it really comes down to um, 
expanding in a really ex like market that's got a ton of opportunity. You know, you talk about uh, the real estate and the fact there's not much competition and the fact that there's not a lot of aggressive roofers out there that do insurance. Do you see like aggressive guys marketing? Who's the biggest roofer in your area? Do you even know? Is there even like one big there's, residential there's a guy? Couple, there's a couple of big ones. I think Valentine Roofing is probably the one of the biggest ones. What's his secret? What does he do? Like his big his biggest secret that I see and I study his business because I admire what he's put together is customer service, mm -hmm. education, um, consistency, and uh, a good place to work. Nice. And what I'm learning is that that is adds value to the roofing system mm -hmm. and trust. It. Nice. So um, what's cool about this is like. You're on social media, but I don't think that you've been to a lot of events with other roofers, right? Or b other contractors, not really? None. And so we got to spend time together this yeah. weekend. You spent time with some other people in the roofing industry and you yeah. know, the power of the masterminds when two like minds come together, yeah. uh, a secondary, more powerful mind is created. Correct. And so um, talk to me a little bit about, you know, what this weekend's kind of helped, how, how it's changed any way you thought or anything yeah, this, it, you know, um, before coming here, I knew that I'm handicapped in the fact that I haven't networked a lot. I don't know a lot of roofers. I don't know anybody in this space. I haven't gone to conferences or, you know, I think I, I went to Job Nibis place one, you know. That's pretty cool. It's really cool. And that, um, it's a whole new world of getting to know people. And so after this weekend, spending time with you, actually normalizing things that I'm going through and hearing your experience and realizing that there's so much more for me to learn so much more for me to understand and um, that there's also a lot of opportunity in the roofing space it's it's there's it's I feel like I'm uncovering a, a oh, sea dude, you're, of you're, you don't have no idea you're, you're fixing to become the next star in roofing and when you're talking about reading John Wooden in prison these these ultimate unfair advantages of your team the fundamentals in business as a CEO are yeah. the core values, the yep. SOPs, the boundaries for leaders, your yes. meeting structure, yeah. how you're managing it, paying attention to it, yeah. and how you're disseminating your message throughout your team. Yeah. And so the fact that you're watching or really have all this influence from John Wooden and we're at this point, yeah. yes, we're going to learn insurance. Yes, we're going to scale door to door. Yes, we're going to get more salesmen and boom sure. on offense. Yeah. But if we can't play fucking defense, dude, we ain't going to win championships. Yeah, that's right. They, we can't stop from scoring, right? Is that not what? It, what? It, That's exactly right. And so, um, you know, kind of to wrap this all up, guys. Uh, you know, this guy has leveled me up. The reality is, it's it's spending time with people at different stages of the journey that help you open your eyes, your perspective, and uh, just to think about, you know how lucky I've had. I've been silver spoon handed. The fact that my dad taught me how to do the sales, taught me how to do the process. Yeah. I grew up around the whole entrepreneur side first. Yeah. And the fact is, dude, there's really not that much difference between me and you. The difference is, you know, you got a business that's killing it in the area. It's highly profitable. Mm -hmm. Dude, your business is worth eight figures. The only thing is, is like, okay, so there's a little bit more there's been 20 years of work plus my dad's work into it, dude, but you could get way further than me faster. And the reality is, is like, I can't wait to be a part of it. And, you know, when I hear about, you know, the sounds of money on the roof and ching, 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 ching. See, I never went through that. Yeah. I never really did the labor part. I sit there and count, well, what, how much do I make a shingle? I think it's a really how cool perspective I because the people that really need it and sometimes are the laborers. And then, you know, maybe not everyone's meant to be a salesman right off the bat, but you don't need to be in college. And if you go on the roof, just know you could go on the roof and follow the path that Anthony followed. And you don't have to be like magic Don Juan with your sales skills right up front. It's not no, about that. You can, you can build yourself into that. And I would say for the guy that's like, probably maybe fearful of sales or talking to people, a lot of roofers are like, I don't like to talk to customers. I don't want to do that. But at the same time, you are building a system. You are a roofer. You've built a system on how to put a roof on. You've built a system on how to manage your crew. So take that same thought process. Take that same tenacity and grit to become a roofer and start leveraging it into the next season of life and getting over those 
obstacles of talking to people. I used to be fearful of talking to people. All right. So if these guys want to coach with you, they want to work with you, yeah. they want to connect with you. How can they get in touch? Um, well, you can subscribe roofer, uh, rooferpreneur on YouTube, uh, the rooferpreneur on Instagram, and you can go to rooferpreneurs.com. You can book a call and buy the course. Dude, it's been awesome having you on this podcast. Uh, more to come. Yes, dude. There's going to be a lot more to come. And, uh, you know, I'm even thinking about going and checking out some of that moss and some of that hidden damage and all them rich people out there. I kind of want to go out to Seattle. So maybe we'll make a well, door-to-door door the, blitz. They, the mold is gold. The mold is gold. Okay, guys. <laughs> Look, subscribe. If you got questions for Anthony, just drop them in the comments. We're answering them all. I appreciate everybody. We look forward to you tuning in, watching the next episode. Thanks for watching.